thank everyone, everyone who who uh, registered for this uh, workshop and that you are attending this. And I would like also to thank our two speakers. Um, let me uh, share my screen. I hope that anyone, uh, everyone can see uh, uh, the introductory slides for this uh, workshop that we hold uh, today. This is uh, about innovative peer review and the role of research libraries in these processes. And it's organized by LIBRA, the Association of European Research Libraries and the uh, Open uh, Research Europe. Um, although, you know, much of the discussion today will be around Open Research Europe, we, we will raise some uh, key questions about the innovations in uh, uh, peer review and how uh, these innovations are uh, affecting uh, uh, what we would call uh, the virtuous life cycle of research and open science. So we have seen many, um, many uh, developments lately, especially in COVID, we saw uh, rapid transformations in the scholarly communication field and uh, innovative in peer review was not uh, left unaffected. Uh, so a lot of the discussion again today is about, for instance, the role of preprints in peer review. Of course, it's uh, the matters of transparency uh, in various uh, stages of peer review. And we would like to, um, uh, to enter this discussion uh, with the spirit of finding some answers about the role of uh, research uh, libraries. Uh, as I told you, it's a, a joint workshop with LIBER and Open Research Europe, which is a European Commission project uh, uh, with, uh, uh, of course, Euro, uh, European Commission, uh, LIBER, uh, uh, Eurodoc, and the Global uh, Young Academy, uh, supported by uh, F1000. So uh, this workshop is, workshop is addressed at research librarians and researchers, of course, uh, who have or may not have experience with the Open Research uh, Europe uh, uh, platform, uh, which is quite new. I mean, it's uh, less than around six months since the official um, launch of the platform, but we have already more than 100 articles published on, on the platform. Uh, so everyone who has interest in open and innovative peer review, even if it uh, doesn't, even, even if he, he or she doesn't have any experience with peer review, we would like to, uh, to be part of uh, this workshop. And we hope that you will be acquainted with the peer review process behind the Aura platform, uh, as well as learn more about uh, open peer review, as I said before. Uh, our two speakers are uh, Kelly Woods, who is a senior uh, associate publisher at F1000 and uh, Open Research Europe supports Open Research Europe platform. Um, she has a strong background in uh, open access uh, scholarly publishing. And prior to uh, joining uh, F1000, she has worked in Frontiers, uh, an open access uh, publisher, and the Royal Society on numerous uh, open access uh, titles and uh, projects. And our second uh, speaker is uh, Judith Pazekaspara, who is uh, head of education and research support uh, department in the University Library of um, Debrecen and the National Library. Uh, and she's also a, a member of the Open Air uh, National Open Access Desk uh, in Hungary. Um, Judith is well known, uh, well known person, especially when somebody um, wants to discuss about things uh, of open science in Hungary. She is one of the key contacts uh, there, and she tries to connect uh, Hungarian stake stakeholders with the uh, open science discourse in the European Union. Uh, and she coordinates a, a lot of activities about dissemination marketing. Uh, training sustainability of open uh, uh, science uh, topics in um, Hungary. So uh, the housekeeping notes are 
perhaps you have seen them before if you have attended the previous sessions of Open, open Science Fair. Uh, as an attendee, you can submit questions in uh, the chat. Uh, you, you can open your mic, we would prefer not to do, uh, but to virtually raise your hand and ask them, uh, some questions. We will uh, receive all questions at the end of uh, the two uh, um, presentations. Uh, and of course, you can uh, use uh, the chat in order to introduce yourself, to let us know um, what is your background, send us some uh, messages. Uh, and of course, directly you can communicate with uh, other uh, attendees. Um, as, as you saw, um, there was a notification that the event is recorded and it will be uh, later uh, uploaded on the Open Science Fair website and on uh, the NOTO, uh, the presentations. And uh, as, I, as I said, please make sure that your microphone is muted in order to uh, uh, let our speakers uh, concentrated on uh, what they have to present and be sure that uh, uh, afterwards we will have plenty of time to discuss uh, everything and no one will uh, left, will leave the, uh, the workshop without uh, any questions. So if you are using Twitter, uh, please use the hashtag OSFair2021 and uh, link your tweet with the Twitter handle Open Science Fair. We would like to see uh, your response uh, to this workshop uh, on uh, Twitter. Uh, and I would like to thank you uh, uh, for bearing with me those uh, five uh, to seven minutes. I would like to give the uh, floor now to Kelly, Kelly Woods. So I'm stopping sharing uh, my, presenta my presentation and Kelly. Perfect. Can everybody see my screen okay? Yes, all good. Excellent. Okay, so um, I'm really happy to, to be here today to talk a little bit about Open Research Europe and our publishing model and the peer review process uh, as well as part of this workshop. So as Yanis mentioned, Open Research Europe officially launched uh, in March uh, this year by F1000 in collaboration with the European Commission and our partner organisations after a public procurement process. And the platform aims to offer beneficiaries of Horizon 2020 and Horizon Europe an easy and high quality venue to publish their research at no cost, ensuring it's in full compliance with the Commission's open access policies. Um, and also, as Yanis mentioned, we're really excited to have recently published our 100th article on the platform as well. So we do have a, quite a new and innovative publishing model that I'll talk a little bit, well, in quite a lot of detail about today. So we operate on a post-publication peer review model of publishing. And this means our papers are published open access with DOIs as preprints whilst we carry out the peer review process, allowing for very quick publication and public access to the work. Um, once the paper is deemed to have passed peer review, which I'll talk a little bit more about later, the papers are then sent to relevant indexes and repositories. So let's look a little bit more in detail at the preprint stage, um, talking about submission, pre-publication checks, and then eventual publication of the article. So because we cover uh, such a wide variety of research areas on Open Research Europe, um, including science, well, pretty much everything you can think of, really, but science, technology, engineering, medicine, humanities and social sciences, we really need to offer a diverse array of article types. So we have the more standard article types that everyone is, is used to, your research articles, your reviews, and those are available across all of the subject areas we cover. But then we also have some more specific article types that are only available within the relevant discipline. So for example, clinical practice articles and case reports are only available for the STEM subjects, and then essays are only available in humanities and social sciences. The European Commission is also committed to capturing all types of research output so that no work coming from their grants is wasted, if you like. So we really want to be able to provide uh, different article types to capture all different types of research outputs. 
And we're really trying to aim to meet the needs of all of the researchers that we serve within all of these research areas, which is there's no small feat. Um, so we are open to feedback on uh, our article types and if there's anything you think we could uh, add here. So once the author has decided on the article type and actually submitted their paper, uh, we do a number of pre-publication checks. So every submission is rigorously checked by our in-house editorial team before it is published. We check that the grant information is appropriate and that the authorship criteria and affiliations are complete. We also check every publication with Authenticate software to check for plagiarism and any high scores there would result in a paper being flagged or potentially uh, not published and withdrawn from the system. We did check that the underlying data has been made available in line with our open data policies. So we operate on a principle of as open as possible, but as closed as necessary. So in general, the data should be deposited in an appropriate repository at the time of publication. But if there is some reason why the data cannot be made available, perhaps it's uh, as part of the patent or there's a confidential or personally identifiable data there, um, then obviously there are exceptions to that rule, but generally speaking, the data should be made available. We also check that the appropriate ethics and consent statements are present and we ask to see those. Um, we check that the article type selected by the author is correct, it's the best match with their paper, and that the relevant guidelines have been followed. We make sure that the methods are detailed and reproducible, and we also do a light copy edit at this stage before sending it off to the typesetters. So once it comes back, or once it's passed all of our pre-publication checks, and, and they, that may require some level of revision from the authors at this stage, um, it will be published on the website as a preprint. Um, so it does receive its own DOI at this point and is shareable and citable already. So you can see at the end of the title, we include these square brackets to give you a little bit more of information about the article, the status of the article and the stage of the peer review. So this article is version one, meaning there haven't been any revised versions submitted yet. And the peer review, we're, we're still waiting on that. So we're awaiting peer review. We're still trying to source the peer reviewers for this article at this time. But you can see in the top left hand corner that it's already started to accrue views and downloads at this early preprint stage, just really highlighting the benefit of getting the research out there as soon as possible. So what actually happens during the peer review process at Open Research Europe? We operate on an author led model of peer review, so authors are asked to submit suggested reviewers as the final part of the pre publication checks that I already talked about. Um, these reviewers are verified by our in-house editorial team, which I'll, I'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, and there are two main ways that the authors provide reviewer suggestions to us. These could be through their own network, uh, their own knowledge of the, their field of research, people that they know or know of that are working in their area, or they can use the Open Research Europe peer review selector tool. Uh, so if they're submitting people from their own network, they simply have to enter their first name, last name, email and affiliation into the free text box um, to submit that person as a referee. Um, and as I said, the editorial team will go through and verify that later. Uh, we do provide a lot of support online to the authors about how to find referees, um, the kind of characteristics and uh, expertise that we're looking for within our referees and how to make sure that we um, are being really diverse with our re reviewers as well. If they're using the Open Research Europe peer review selector tool, this will search uh, text, uh, sorry, titles and abstracts across Web of Science um, and match articles that are similar to the current submission and suggest reviewers from the authors of those relevant papers. The authors of this paper can then go through those suggested reviewers and choose the ones that they think are the most appropriate. Uh, throughout all of this, the editorial team obviously remains uh, on standby if further support is needed. So once the names have been selected and they have been sent, uh, submitted on the form, they await verification from the Open Research Europe editorial team. So generally we're checking that the reviewers are qualified, that they have 
um, enough publications in the area as a lead author and that they have published on this topic recently. We want to make sure that there's no conflict of interest because the reviewers are being selected by the authors, of course, so we want to make sure that they're impartial. So we're checking that they haven't co-authored with the authors recently, they don't work at the same institution, they're not collaborating on the grant or any other grants, and just generally speaking that they don't have any competing interests. And we also reiterate to the authors that it's important to maintain diversity within our reviewer pool. So that means uh, geographical diversity, but also gender and career stage. We do also allow um, co-reviewing. So if there's any more junior members of the team that would like to contribute to the review of this article, they can do so. So early postdocs or PhD students, for example, um, in collaboration with their supervisor, and they still get named as a referee on the paper. And we'll also identify if we think there's any additional expertise needed at this stage, like a specific statistics expert as a referee, for example. Once we've verified the reviewer's suitability, we'll feed this back to the authors and let them know which reviewers are suitable. Um, we obviously remain um, available to the authors in if there's any issues or if they wanted to flag that they're having trouble finding referees. So there are certain areas, for example, really niche research fields where the criteria that I've mentioned might not be appropriate. And so we can work with the authors on a case by case basis in that situation. Once we've received five reviews that have been verified, then the article can be published on the website. And then once it's published, we then begin trying to reach out to those verified reviewers. And so once we actually get their positive response and they've received our review, we're going to check to make sure that all aspects of the article have been reviewed and the peer review questions we've sent the reviewer have been answered. We do tailor the peer review questions for the different article types that we offer and also for the different subject areas to really try to make sure that we're uh, covering the necessary basis um, for all those different types of articles that we have. It's not a one size fits all approach. We check the reports for tone and language and check that the correct status has been applied. And then we publish the report online. Um, so there are three different statuses of peer review that the referees might choose. Um, approved, meaning that the paper is scientifically sound and they're only suggesting minor, if any, improvements. Then we have approved with reservations, meaning there's a number of small changes or maybe one or two more significant revisions that are required to improve the paper. And then finally, not approved. So this is a paper with major fundamental flaws or uh, a paper that would require really serious revision or additional work uh, to get it up to scratch to be published on the platform. Of course, the authors are then asked uh, to revise their, or, uh, their paper based on what the referees have said. If the reviewers decline to review, uh, we will update the system with the declination and the declination reason. We let the authors know and ask them if we need more suggestions, which will again go through the verification process. And we can provide support for selections to the authors if necessary. So when a review has been published, um, the reviewer identity is made publicly available. The reviewer report is also made publicly available. We have to add a statement uh, declaring any competing interests and we ask the reviewers to declare their expertise as well. So we are operating on a fully open peer review model here. And I'll show you a little bit what that looks like. So what's, what do the articles look like once they've actually passed peer review and, and what's happening to them at this stage? So this is what they look like. Um, as you can see, it's very similar but the square brackets at the end of the title has been updated to show that the peer review has, status has changed and we've now received two approved peer review reports on this paper. Um, on the tab on the right hand side of the screen, you can see more information about the open peer review that has taken place for this article. So an overview of the statuses submitted by the reviewers you can see a link to the original version of the article. If there had been rounds of revision to this article, there would actually be a version two and a version three link here in this box. And you can click back and view the first or, or all of the previous versions to see how the paper has actually changed over the course of the peer review process. 
You can also click in and read the individual review reports submitted by the reviewers as well. And you can see a summary of all of the changes that have happened between the different versions. So if you were to open up the peer review report, this is what it would look like. You can see the status of the peer review report at the top and then the details of the referee and then the full peer review submitted by the referee. And you can also see the responses from the authors, how they've actually addressed all of the comments raised by the referee as well. Um, the, ref the reviewer reports do have their own DOIs and are fully citable. And readers of the platform also have the ability to comment on the article and the peer review reports themselves to continue the scientific discourse even after the paper has been through peer review or even past peer review. So what are the main benefits of publishing with Open Research Europe? Um, it's really quick. The articles can be published as quickly as a week, depending on the initial level of revision that we're requesting from the authors. Um, as I mentioned, we, we have a really diverse range of article types to try to make sure we can capture all different types of research outputs. We do take the burden off of the authors by ensuring that we fulfill all of the commission's open access and data sharing requirements laid out in the grant agreements for Horizon 2020 and Horizon Europe. We hope that we're going somewhat to combat the reproducibility crisis by ensuring that all the data is published alongside the article and our entire process is fully transparent. So it's open access, open peer review, open data, and it's an author driven model of peer review as well. Um, all of our guidelines are available on the website if you really like to dig into the nitty gritty of it. And of course, the costs of publication are met directly by the commission, so the authors don't need to worry about finding article processing charges uh, or finding funds to meet any article processing charges within their grant. Um, so yeah, that's a bit of a summary of Open Research Europe, our publishing model and the peer review system. And um, so I look forward to your questions later on in the in the workshop. Stop sharing my Thank screen. you, Kelly. Thank you very much for uh, the presentation and for keeping uh, the time. Um, now I would like to uh, ask from Judith to come on the stage, this virtual stage, and uh, share her slides with us. There, there is already one question. I will uh, address this uh, later to, to Kelly all together with at least one that I have for Kelly. Uh, so please feel free to uh, ask whatever you think uh, that you, you, you need to um, have uh, very clear in your mind. And I'm sure that Kelly and Judith at the end we will, will find the, the time to, uh, to reply. So Judith. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, we are experiences that uh, scholarly communication has undergone tremendous changes in recent decades. Uh, but the process it ha uh, itself has not changed much. It has several functions that have been the same for centuries, such as publication, peer review, dissemination, and preservation. Uh, using digital technologies uh, offers many opportunities uh, uh, to share scientific results. There's an increased need for researchers, users, and research funders to make research results immediately openly available and to give credit not just for publication, uh, but for, uh, for other scholarly works such as peer review, data, software, and there are so many other. The channels of scholarly communication must be designed to be flexible, innovative, but at the same time cost effective. What is open science? Open science gives a solution to the changing, uh, changing ecosystem. Open science is such a scientific uh, practice where the generated information within the research process is openly available, where research is collaborative, transparent and accessible. Its main purpose is to support the continuous development of research, science and innovation. It uses digital technologies to share knowledge. In this sense, uh, open science provides a framework that is strongly supported by research fun uh, funders uh, in the recent years. The cultural change of scholarly communication have started. 
uh, thanks to these digital achievements. But as long as we maintain the old incentive system, it is very difficult to properly exploit the possibilities offered by the new framework. Open science itself has been described in so uh, many ways and in several terms. Most often uh, it is identified with an umbrella uh, but as you can see it on my slide, uh, I rather use the mushroom uh, term by Eva Mendes, the president of the European uh, Open Science Platform. This picture gives a much more spectacular picture of what a complex system we are talking about. And on it, you can see open peer review is one segment of uh, open science. Uh, <clears throat> as one segment of open science, uh, we are uh, at open air dealing with uh, open peer review as well, um, like mapping up the new models uh, of peer review, helping to strengthen the evaluation of research via open peer review, describing uh, alternative peer review tools, seeking for answers how to motivate and credit review work, and researching the efficacy of different open peer review models. Let's dive into the topic of uh, open peer review, but firstly, we have to define what uh, peer review uh, exactly means. Uh, peer review is a, a quality assurance mechanism where scholarly works are analyzed by others out of the feedbacks, which uh, are used to improve uh, work and make uh, the final decision regarding uh, this selection. There is a changing role uh, in the actors of uh, scholarly communication. Uh, the peer review, uh, role of the peer reviewers are changing, role of the editors are changing. Uh, there is a growing responsibility of authors and uh, we are expecting different involvements of uh, the peers in this e uh, ecosystem. This is why uh, open Peer review is, uh, I would say, essential. Uh, in an attempt uh, systematical, uh, to systematically categorize the uh, numerous uh, definitions of open peer review, Tony Ross Hilarer uh, uh, counted uh, more than 120 definitions. According to his finding, uh, open peer review is an umbrella term for a number of overlapping ways that peer review models can be adopted. Uh, in lines with the aims of open science. By uh, analyzing uh, these definition, uh, he was uh, able to build uh, a coherent uh, topology, which uh, includes the following kinds of uh, open peer, uh, peer review uh, spectrums. This could be divided uh, into two different aspects. There is a primary aspect uh, which uh, contains uh, uh, open identities, open reports, and open participation. The secondary aspects are open interactions, open pre-review manuscripts, open final version commenting, and open platforms. Open identities are when authors and reviewers are aware of each other's identity. Open reports are when a review report published alongside with the uh, the relevant article. Open participation is uh, available for a wider community uh, whom are able to contribute to the review process. Open uh, interactions uh, are uh, direct discussions between authors, reviewers, or maybe reviewers, reviewers. Uh, open uh, pre-review manuscripts are uh, preprints available online uh, in advance to be peer reviewed. Open final version commenting uh, are, uh, <clears throat> it's a review commenting on the final version of record of, uh, final version uh, of record of the publication. So it's the final publication. Uh, and uh, we can talk about open platforms or it's even called decoupled review. Uh, it is when review uh, is facilitated by a different organizational entity uh, than the venue of publication. What are the pros and cons of these different types of uh, uh, peer review, uh, open peer review focusing, uh, I will focus on the primary aspects. 
The pros in open identities are uh, the increased quality of reports. Uh, it fost uh, fosters transparency to avoid conflicts of interest. And uh, it, has, uh, it gives a more civil language, uh, both in the review and in, uh, and in the response. The negatives uh, uh, of it are <clears throat> difficult in uh, taking and giving critical feedbacks. And it's a labor intense process, but I would say review is a labor intense process uh, um, for sure. Uh, what about open reports? Um, the pros of open reports are uh, the feedbacks uh, improves work and uh, provide a con uh, contextual information. It, uh, it is giving a uh, when you are having open reports, most people give better feedbacks. Uh, and with this, it, uh, it is increasing the review quality. It enables credit and reward for the review work, which is really important. Uh, it help uh, training young researcher in peer reviewing because they are able to see what was going on formerly. What are uh, the negatives? Uh, higher, uh, the negatives are higher refuser rates amongst potential reviewers. Uh, it is a time consuming uh, and uh, more demanding process. And uh, the fear of being exposed, uh, this is uh, a fear most, uh, especially for early career researchers. The third is open participation. Um, the positives in open participation are, um, <clears throat> it expands the pool of reviewers. Uh, it can include uh, non-traditional research actors. This is uh, where um, <clears throat> citizens might interact. Uh, it supports cross-disciplinary dialogue and uh, it increases the number of reviewers being part of the debate. What are the negatives? Uh, the time issues, uh, difficult to motivate uh, the commentators to take part uh, and deliver useful critics. Uh, sometimes uh, reviewers uh, don't leave as much in-depth responses and feedback from non-competent uh, participants are uh, will be left behind, but we wouldn't be able to do uh, much with it. What do uh, these different types uh, of open peer reviews look in practice? Now on my slide, you can see uh, peer journal is uh, pra uh, practice in open peer review. At peer journal, they have an optional open peer review, which means that peer review is still done as single blind. However, once manuscripts uh, has been accepted, then reviewers have the option to sign their reviews. Additionally, authors have the option to make the entire submission and review audit trail publicly available after the publication. Um, according to their data, 30% of the uh, reviewers have signed their reviews and 80% of authors have made their review history publicly available. Uh, when uh, authors choose to make uh, their uh, history publicly uh, available, Peer Journal creates them a, a page, uh, as you can see it on my uh, slide at the left-hand side. Uh, and this is uh, this is uh, this page will, go, will goes for the publication history. Uh, it mm, will show the editor in charge and the reviewers' comments. If uh, some reviewers agreed to be shown uh, their name uh, to be shown, then they will be there by their name. If uh, the ones uh, the ones that hasn't been uh, uh, agreed on having their name on, then they will uh, mm, be there as anonymous reviewers. Uh, each, round, uh, will, uh, each round of review will have a separate version section uh, and uh, like, you can track down the whole review process and you are able to uh, get through the original submission. Uh, at the very bottom of my slide, you can see uh, blue uh, 
two or like a citation bar. Uh, this is how you are able to cite uh, the review work. Reviewers uh, get a trackable long-term persistent uh, credit. They get a DOI for their uh, review and they will, be, uh, uh, they will be able to get credit for the review work. Let's uh, go to another platform, Science Open Platform. Uh, this uh, <clears throat> platform offers a built-in infrastructure for open post-publication peer review. Uh, users can uh, comment and review with their full identity. They, are, they have to use ORCID. And uh, the review itself requires a certain level of expertise. They measure it by five peer reviewed articles attached to their review history or reviewers profile, or uh, all the review reports uh, received a citable cross ref DOI. Authors may reply to reviews via the comment functions, uh, creating a transparent, a transparent discussion uh, via the platform. Uh, you can invite reviewer, uh, reviewers to your articles uh, from the community. It works uh, nice and properly. The next uh, <clears throat> uh, the, uh, the next uh, practical uh, peer, uh, open peer review, sort of open peer review, uh, uh, I have as a um, example is Frontiers uh, publisher. Uh, they have a rigorous uh, review. Uh, it is a collaborative peer review, but uh, at the very end, uh, the reviewers uh, the identities of the re reviewers are remain anonymous during the whole review period. When the manuscript is accepted for publication, uh, the names of the reviewers who endorse uh, its publication appear on the publisher and the article, and this is without ex uh, exception. So all reviewers uh, will be on uh, the published version. Uh, they have a collaborative peer review, as I uh, said, it unites authors, reviewers, uh, handli handling editor, and if needed, the special uh, sh uh, specialty chief editor. They, they are having a, in a, a direct uh, dialogue. Uh, this enables them a quick interaction and, uh, and they got uh, to, and they get to a quick consensus. Editors and reviewers work uh, with the authors uh, on improving their manuscripts. What, how does it look, uh, what does it look like in uh, practice and how, what does it look like in Publens? Publens in a decapil peer review, uh, it, it uh, works as a decapil peer review. It, uh, it, Actually, it is, uh, this platform offer, offers a verified peer review and journal editing history for uh, researchers. Um, and uh, the platform uh, offers for publishers to improve the quality and efficacy of their peer review processes. It, it helps uh, publishers give their reviewers the recognition they deserve and build a stronger relationship uh, with their community. So uh, they can have the review at Publens and uh, I mean the publishers and uh, publish uh, the uh, journals via their platforms. Transpose uh, is an in initiative uh, to built uh, a database of journal policies. They are focusing on open peer review, co-reviewing and, de uh, and detailed preprint policies. Uh, their name comes from Transparency in Scholarly Publishing for Open Scholarship uh, Evaluation. Uh, <clears throat> as uh, you can see it uh, on my uh, slide, uh, uh, this is, uh, they have, uh, analyzed uh, transposed data, how different fields are dealing with uh, peer review. Uh, 
not just the open peer review, but the, what are the, the peer review processes. And as you can see, uh, health and medical sciences are um, um, achieving in not blinded uh, peer review, but the humanities and the social sciences and businesses, uh, business economics and management are mostly uh, their uh, percentage is really high in double blind uh, peer review, but there are a lot of uncertainty uh, of uh, the of, of the data, they are uncertain how to uh, where to category, uh, categorize the different uh, policies. Why uh, to choose open peer review? Uh, this is a good question. Uh, it is transparent, it is more reliable, it gives a credit for the reviewers, it can be an educational tool. Uh, it will improve uh, accountability and it can improve the quality of feedback. So we have uh, six good reasons uh, <clears throat> to uh, use open peer review and this uh, uh, it connects to open science. There are two ways uh, to participate in open peer review. I, uh, retain the current peer review system, but with open reviews and identities, or develop an entirely new system, uh, what is open to the community. Open peer review models are developing, improvements are made and lessons uh, have learned, but we are, we are not there. Uh, because uh, how these practices work out in the long run, we are unable to see at the moment. It would be really necessary to have an open dialogue with publishers about the review data they are collecting and to have uh, uh, these review data analyzed and be able to have a better picture uh, about, uh, the, trim, uh, about the, the open peer review practices. Now they are tremendously varying. Thank you for your uh, attention and uh, waiting uh, for your uh, questions. Thank you very much, Judith, uh, for your presentation. Um, okay, great. Thank you, Kelly, for opening your video uh, camera. And um, we still have only one question, and uh, this is addressed to, to, to Kelly. Um, uh, a few others arrived right now. So uh, the first one is, um, do you include monographs in your process in Open uh, Research Europe? So we don't currently include monographs at the minute, but um, we are looking at ways that we can better serve the, particularly the humanities and social sciences um, areas with different article types, potentially such as monographs. So it's definitely an area that we are looking to expand into. Mm -hmm. And related to this question by uh, Neil Stern, uh, I had a question to Judith. Uh, so you showed some examples from uh, opening peer review in certain disciplines and in certain uh, kind uh, types of uh, publications, certain formats, which are close to the standard paper format. So have you have you any experience have you any uh, let's say evidence from successful uh, peer review in monographs because open access monographs it's equally vital and we we see that uh, you know we are opening the access to um, monographs but can we open also you know the, the process of reviewing for monographs uh, actually, I was uh, diving into and uh, trying to find out, uh, uh, is there any open peer review process for uh, mono, uh, like working op open peer review processes for monographs? I, I Actually, I couldn't find evidence, but this is because monographs are uh, handled always differently. Uh, like uh, they, they are not really reviewed uh, as uh, like journals, but uh, they have like um, 
uh, when they are out, they are published, they have like a review about the monograph that whether if it is good and goes for whom and, and whom. So it's like uh, this, uh, the, the review process for monograph is totally different than uh, for journals. Uh, so for me, it wasn't uh, sure uh, whether uh, anyone is dealing with at the moment open uh, reviewing for uh, mm. open peer review for monographs. Mm. I, ha I have only one evidence here in Greece, but it's not actually about uh, monographs. It's, let's say, uh, about open textbooks. Okay. And here we have a process saying that uh, somebody writes an open textbook and then he is accompanied by a set of critical readers readers who uh, read the manuscript while uh, you know it is written and uh, then uh, they make comments they uh, refine some uh, parts uh, and so but it's not actual uh, let's say um, peer review in the, in the sense it's like uh, escorting the um, author in uh, this process mm -hmm. um, so uh, I have another question about Kelly from Robert, Robert Bianchi. So um, do links to a given, given paper so um, or change according to the status of uh, the, the version? Uh, I mean, uh, I guess that Robert says that do we have separate links for each uh, version of, of the manuscript? Yeah, so there are separate links for each of the versions, but the, the most, so the main link, the first link that comes out when the article is first published, that will always bring you to the most updated version of that manuscript, whether it's been revised two or three times, it's always going to take you to the latest one. If you do happen to find yourself on an older version of a manuscript, a pop-up does come up on the screen to tell you there is a more updated version of this manuscript or this paper available. Would you like to look at that? Or we recommend that you look at that. You can then suppress that message for one day um, and view the older version if you would like to. But yeah, if you were to come back again tomorrow, it's again going to remind you that there is a more updated version. So we do want to make sure that we are sort of promoting and pushing the, the, the corrected version or the, the most improved version of the manuscript that we have. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and another question is, um, of course, in this presentation, we focused on the open preview. And I know that there is a lot of documentation about that. But how is the platform and the editorial team financially supported? I mean, what is the, the, the cost and how is it covered? And things like that. Yeah, so I mentioned that this platform was part of a public procurement offered by the European Commission that was ultimately won by F1000 and our, our partner organizations. Um, but the, so we're financially supported by the, the European Commission as a result of that procurement. Um, but we do charge an article processing charge to the European Commission for every article that we publish. Um, it's 780 euros that we're charging uh, for each article, I believe, and you can see on the website a full breakdown of exactly where all of the money from that APC is going and which departments it's supporting and how it's helping us to run and improve the platform for the future. I'll see if I can drop a link in the chat. Great. Uh, Guillaume Wright has sent us a, a link to, to the chat about how Rutledge is uh, implementing uh, open uh, peer review in, uh, in books, I guess. Uh, before going to another question to you, Kelly, I will go to you because Nils um, asks from uh, his publishing experience of academic books and journals in the humanities and social sciences, uh, Nils would argue that there are many similarities in the peer review process prior to the publication. Uh, not big book review after the book reviews after the, the, the uh, the publication. Uh, however, the diversity and complexity of monograph peer review might be maybe higher. So, uh, how do you see the difference? I mean, the difference between the two um, kinds of uh, publications. Okay, so uh, how might see the difference between a journal article and between a monograph? I, I guess that. The, that is the question. Uh, in, the, in the very, very simple uh, form is, is this, the, the question is this. There, uh, Niels, and uh, forgive me, Niels, if I'm not interpreting well your, uh, your, your question is, 
uh, saying that the complexity might be mm -hmm. uh, might be uh, higher when somebody um, reviews um, a book. Yeah, definitely. And and we know that book, you know, it's very it's very uh, is widely used in social sciences. Yeah, in social sciences and humanities. Yep. Uh, the the processes of uh, uh, like for books, as I know, uh, the process. They give it out uh, like before uh, publishing. They are giving it out to, uh, to uh, academic reviewer, and uh, uh, then uh, it will be approved somehow. But uh, as the process is uh, for uh, it is blind, uh, I would say. Uh, so uh, it, it is hard to see how how complex it is. I'm not from that field. I'm sorry. So. I'm from uh, more of the journal field, uh, so it's it's hard to uh, answer on uh, uh, or see that uh, complexity of uh, monographs. But uh, can you, Neil, uh, like talk uh, about this for for us? Or okay, yes, um, yes, thank you, thank you. So I just wanted to because you said that that there was a, a different process going on for for books and monographs. So I just wanted if you could elaborate on that um, uh, because of course there is um, also uh, uh, a, a thorough peer review process for for monographs uh, I agree that it it uh, there are not many examples of open peer review I just saw the one from Ravlich mentioned here which is interesting so I was just trying to understand better what you said uh, regarding the differences between your experience in, in general publishing and in in, in book publishing related to the peer review process. So my experience, uh, I, I don't really have experience with book pub publishing. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's okay. I mean, uh, the, uh, as Nils uh, said, and you said, Judith, it's something that it's not, let's say, uh, widespread. And perhaps, I mean, we see, uh, that open access monographs are emerging right now and university presses here in Europe especially are, are starting uh, uh, doing some work there and uh, I don't know if we have anyone from uh, the very very handy examples from Stockholm University Press or you know from uh, UCL uh, who are publishing openly monographs and how they uh, implement uh, open peer review. Uh, I, I promise that I will I will ask my colleagues in Liber in the working groups and perhaps we do we can do together with Athena we can coordinate let's say something like a, a response after uh, the uh, the workshop. Uh, now we allow me to to move to another question to um, to Kelly uh, whether uh, Open Research Europe. Uh, should be integrated into bibliographic databases like Scopus or Web of Science or anything. And of course, Open Air, um, Explore, and, uh, uh, and Steffi, who is asking things that only uh, in this way institutional publications can be counted for institutional output. And I guess that she has, she has a right here. Yeah, so we are working to get Open Research Europe indexed in as many relevant indexes and repositories as we possibly can. Um, obviously, it is a very new platform and you do have to meet a number of uh, criteria before you can be indexed in, in certain places. Um, Scopus as well has these criteria and they're all different. So um, as soon as we meet those criteria, we will be submitting applications to, to become indexed in those places. Um, currently, we're sending all of our content that has passed peer review to Zenodo and from there it's already being pushed to open air I believe I'll double check that that's working properly but it should already be in open air um, so yeah it's it's an ongoing process and um, we, we hope to be indexed in a massive variety of places to cover all the different disciplines that we cover um, in the future. Um, we still have a lot of time and I have a couple of questions from you I don't know uh, who else would like to um, uh, to add something. Um, going back to Judith, I would like to ask, I mean, um, 
we you, you talk about open peer review and review among peers, but what about, I mean, here in, uh, when we discuss about open science, we also discuss about opening uh, to other um, groups that relate to science. And for instance, uh, we talk about citizens and how citizens uh, uh, support, engage in science uh, processes. So uh, do you have a, 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 um, uh, anything to, to mention about the role of citizens who are, who might not be, you know, formally peers in a field. Uh, in, in, what about the role in the peer review process? Especially Actually, now that we have these mm -hmm. platforms that, you know, uh, invite uh, other people than the registered. Uh, Actually, peers. because uh, if peer review is collaborative, then uh, people can... Uh, uh, collaborate or review or just comment and maybe their comment could be uh, in, uh, an improvement uh, for our scholarly work. Uh, and uh, citizen science is, uh, I think, uh, really important nowadays because a lot of uh, the research uh, data generated by citizens. So uh, we are analyzing a lot of uh, data from uh, citizen scientists, and I think they should have the right uh, to like uh, openly comment or openly review uh, our uh, findings later on. So in that sense, I would include them in the open peer review process, definitely. Uh, I have... Um, Mm, check uh, whether we have evidence on uh, this. Actually, if uh, mm, people are uh, reviewing, uh, like community, they are doing community review, they, uh, citizens can review uh, in that sense. Great, thank you. Thank you, Judith. Um, if I could just add as well, I think this yes. is where the, the plain language summaries or the lay summaries really come in handy um, for this, this type of, you know, making sure that the science is understandable to the citizen scientists and, and not just the researchers in, in the labs and, and the humanities and social sciences researchers as well. Um, but so on Open Research Europe, we do invite authors to submit a plain language summary and that is published on the website as well um, alongside the publication. Um, but I think yeah, more work needs to be done in the area of plain language summaries um, to sort of really push the, the research that the citizens are sometimes providing the data for, as you say, and also they're paying for in some occasions uh, to, to make them, uh, to make it a little bit more understandable for them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I have a question for you, Kelly. Uh, in, in, uh, in, in the model that you follow um, in ORE, about peer review, uh, I noticed an increased interactivity among the editorial team, the authors, and the reviewers. So it's it's a lot, a lot of back and forth messages and you know versions and uh, you know comments. And based on your experience, uh, perhaps not only you know from Ore but your previous publishing experience, uh, how, how how intense do you think that this reviewing process is? And do you have an evidence of fatigue? Because one of the problems in peer review, uh, as it is mentioned by studies, you know, it's the fatigue of the reviewers and uh, you cannot easily recruit good reviewers. You cannot easily, let's say, uh, receive the reviews on time and things like that. Yeah, so as uh, Judith mentioned as well, it's, it, it is a really labor intensive process to submit a review. Um, and we really do appreciate all of the hard work that goes into a good review. And we don't want to put too much strain on the goodwill of reviewers. So we do ensure that we don't invite reviewers to work on multiple papers at the same time, at least with us. But of course, that does not preclude them from also reviewing on the many other journals that are out there. Um, but we think that our author led review process should help to ensure that we're being constantly recommended with new reviewers. So we're not consistently pulling from the same pool of people over and over again. Um, and though this does put a little bit more work onto the author than more traditional models of peer review, um, the editorial team is on hand to assist when they are struggling to find reviewers. Um, and we also offer the uh, peer review selector tool 
um, that I explained during the presentation. But I will say um, so far in Open Research Europe's life, we are um, we're not having to invite as many reviewers as I have previously experienced um, to in order to get the the num the required number of reviews that we that we asked for on the paper. So it seems like people are uh, very keen to review for Open Research Europe. Um, and I hope that that continues past the first six months. Um, but yeah, I think a lot more does need to be done in this field to, to credit reviewers for the work that's being done. Um, obviously, we are linked to, we all of our reviewers have to sign up with their ORCID ID. So when they submit a review to us, it's linked there. We also name them, obviously, and um, the reviews are citable. So they do get a DOI for that. But I think a lot more work needs to be done in terms of crediting, um, crediting reviewers. Yeah. Great. Uh, I don't see any more comments or questions coming in. Um, and I have, uh, you know, the green light to end this workshop earlier, but I, I do have another question um, uh, for Judith. And um, you, you, I mean, Kelly mentioned that uh, through the process that they follow, they try to um, achieve a diversity in calling reviewers to uh, to have a, a balance between you know the genders and perhaps the younger and the senior uh, more senior uh, researchers um, things like that. Uh, at the same time, I mean, even in the paper of of Tony Ross Hlauer, we have this. Um, this critique about the reviewer bias. I mean, we can see some bias in the reviewing because somebody comes from a country that it's not perceived as advanced as um, uh, the one that the reviewer, the reviewer comes, things like that. I mean, there are some sort of prejudices that some reviewers uh, have. So do you think that open science and open peer review is, um, let's say, the, 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 the right solution for, for this? Is there anything else that we can, uh, we can do? Actually, uh, open science, yes, uh, it's the right solution uh, in uh, my vision and uh, as, as we see so far. But uh, as I started my presentation, we need to change somehow the incentive system. Because if the incentive system uh, changes due to the technological changes, and due to the so many work that a variety of works that we are doing uh, as researchers, like research now is a team science. There are like not too many uh, research fields that uh, stay single, uh, like a single person can do from A to Z and finish up the whole research process. So it's a team science and all processes, all certain processes should be somehow, uh, somehow incentivized. Otherwise, it's, uh, I don't know, uh, this is, I, I think this is how we would have a solution for everything. If like people get uh, 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 some credit for peer review, and their university or like where they work or the, the field they are working at say, you are great. You did uh, 15 peer review this year. You won the, I don't know what award for it is. They would be like happy. And if the university says, okay, peer review is some, it's a, it's a really time effective work. And we give credit for uh, peer reviewing. Well, I mean, for you, you did 15 peer reviews. Yeah, this is your research researcher work as well. So it is uh, now these were hidden in, uh, in uh, like in walls in, in like single rooms and we didn't really know about it until we had like some open peer review startings. And now we see that how uh, it is evolving. And I think we should like somehow get uh, uh, information on uh, which are the best practices and try to focus on these best practices. I, I love the way Open Research Europe works though. So, I mean, I, I like that practice, but uh, 
we should have the data, we should analyze that and uh, see it to specialize, maybe to specializing to fields and then uh, have some, uh, we, then we will have some uh, insights that how it should, uh, uh, I mean, uh, open peer review, how should be uh, developed in the different fields and how should be incentivized. Because out of these uh, data, we would be able to like find out what the needs of our researchers. Great. I don't know whether I was clear or not. Um, but open no, science yeah. is for, I think open science is uh, uh, what we should uh, move through. Like we are in the culture change anyways. Yeah. Uh, I think that you were very, very clear. Um, so Robert, Robert Bianchi uh, um, has a question whether there are any info sources for new platforms, creating peer review systems, guidelines or support. I think that you, you did show some cases uh, in some uh, journals uh, that and some publishers who um, implement uh, open peer review. Uh, from my side, I think that like, of course, Judith can reply uh, to this question, but before uh, doing uh, so, I would like to add that there are um, quite a few um, uh, cases where um, there are platforms that try to link preprints in repositories, in uh, archives, in subject archives, uh, with uh, some uh, journals and therefore take the preprints and the reviews on those preprints and migrate them uh, to, to the general process. Uh, but I don't know, do, do you have anything else to add for? Um, uh, I just, ah, uh, uh, I just pasted uh, in uh, the chat that uh, there is a guidelines for open uh, peer review implementation as uh, uh, from uh, Tony, Ross Hallauer and Edith Gerug. Uh, this contains uh, some insights uh, for, uh, and uh, like tells about different plot forms and uh, like what are the ones that uh, somebody should focus on if want to have A, B, C, or D or whatever uh, open peer review style. But uh, actually it is always, uh, I think uh, you have to decide uh, uh, disciplinary, but there, there is no, no bad open peer review. So it's like, if you just publish the uh, publish uh, post-publication, uh, the, the reviews, that's open peer review as well. If you decide to have uh, 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 an innovative platform, then it's going to be better in the long run, I would say, but it, it depends on it depends on your money. It depends on uh, the research field and so on. I think uh, that uh, uh, journal article would help, though. Mm -hmm. Great. So perhaps you saw in the chat box that Athena, Athena uh, said. Uh, wrote that we are setting a working group on innovative peer review. Uh, we have a call a couple of months now. Uh, there are still a room for librarians uh, in the research libraries network. And uh, we would like to uh, explore uh, the role of research libraries in innovative peer review. So if you are a Libra member, uh, please consider uh, joining us. If you are not, please send me a message. Uh, or you can find me easily on uh, uh, Twitter. If you have an account there, send me a message and see how we can uh, partner on, on, on this. Um, I don't. I, I do not know. I don't think that uh, I have anything else to add. So, if uh, none of our uh, participants. Uh, here in this workshop, I uh, would like to ask anything. I would like to, to end this workshop a quarter earlier so we can uh, go and see other uh, uh, sessions. 
another presentation so of Open Science Fair. It's, it's a very packed program. It's a very uh, tight program. There are a lot of uh, interesting uh, presentations. I don't see uh, anything coming in. So I would like to thank Kelly and Judith for the presentations and the discussion. I would like to add uh, all the attendees uh, for uh, keeping us company uh, uh, today and for um, uh, sharing uh, their concerns and their questions. And of course, I would like to uh, ask Athena for uh, setting up this uh, uh, workshop. Uh, and we will see uh, each other in following uh, meetings. Uh, there is a lot of things that we can do uh, about uh, peer review, and uh, I would be happy to, to see you in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.